Jason Turchin is the founder of the Broadway Investor Club. More than a club or a fund, this is what I call a think tank for people passionate about Broadway and entertainment. Using his entrepreneur and legal background, Jason is the definition of invention. He's rethinking our current economic models so we can build a healthier Broadway community around new ideas and new technology. Jason's looking to the future and how the next generation are interacting with entertainment in dynamically different ways. He's helping make Broadway more future-proof. And in this episode, he talks about how he's doing it bit by bit. Well, hello, Jason Turchin, founder of the Broadway Investor Club. We are so glad to have you. Thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Interesting how we got connected. It was actually through a mutual investor that we both know. And as soon as this investor told me about you, I was like, I really want to hear what you're doing. And they were so enthusiastic about what you were doing. And you were starting to say a little bit off the record, right? Before we started recording about your, how you came to be. And I was like, this is not what you set out to do necessarily, right? Like this, this is the surprise career. Is that right? Which is exciting. It's the unintentional entrepreneur. You know, I've, I've always loved business. I've always loved the entertainment business in particular. And it, it sort of merged uh, with my family's background, my son's background in entertainment and my background in law and the entertainment music side. It was sort of that combination of our passion. And then we realized very early when we started, when we launched the Broadway Investors Club, that there are so many people around the country that felt the same way that we did, looking for access to the industry and opportunities in the industry. And there was a disconnect. And I feel like we've figured out that merge between the two sides. So Jason, you came from the music management company side of things, or that's part of your expertise. What got you started? It You said you had a family connection? Yeah, so I started uh, back when I was in law school, so we're going more over 20 years ago now, I really fell in love with copyright, intellectual property, just the, the music side of music and entertainment, and took a number of courses. I was vice president of our entertainment and sports law society at University of Miami School of Law. And uh, I started a management company back then. I was trying to trying to get a job. And I learned back in, in South Florida that they were most, mostly solo practitioners. So it was very hard to get a job with an attorney. So a friend of mine and I started a management company representing songwriters and musicians. And we put together an album. We were shopping it to try to get some record deals for people. And it was a great experience for me just to get that hands-on learning that we weren't able to get. We couldn't find a person to who was looking to hire an intern or anybody down there. And so that kind of started me on that path. And then when I, uh, uh, my third year of law school, I worked for a firm that they were representing some songwriters in litigation. So it was a, a well-known songwriter or well-known musician who was being sued by a former manager trying to take a percentage of his income for the rest of his life saying, you know, I made you who you are. And so I got to see that side of the law and, and really get into contract disputes, management disputes, the litigation side of things. And then life got in the way. Uh, I, I took a pivot. I started, we, my wife and I started a family and uh, it just, I, I needed to have a pivot to, to be able to raise our family. And so I started working for a firm doing more victims rights cases, personal injury and accident cases, a lot of product liability, like bad products that hurt people. And so we were representing a lot of victims against large corporations who put out bad products. Uh, and then my son, we noticed when he was about, well, when he was about two, we noticed he was much more, he started playing around with instruments. Like he would bang things to a particular rhythm. He, if I was playing a little bit on a piano, he was trying to keep up with the, whatever the tempo was that I was playing and he was playing along with it and I would switch it up and then he would switch it up. And so we noticed something was a little different musically with him. And we started hearing from other people, you know, really consider having getting him lessons or something and he was maybe I don't know, three maybe he was trying to reach up trying to pull himself up and he would keep hitting the keys on the keyboard on the piano and then try to hum along with the note that he was playing so we started him in lessons and fast forward uh when he was eight he started auditioning for some summer programs in new york and uh got signed by an agent started working about two weeks after and that was about eight years ago so that kind of that sidebar for him 
during that process, about 10, 12 years ago, my wife and I, yeah, so my wife and I started uh, investing in Broadway shows about 10 to 12 years ago. I just, I enjoyed the entertainment business. I wanted to learn more about the theater business. Our family has always loved theater. So we started investing in shows. Uh, and then through my son's experiences, uh, it kind of led us to you know, put it together and see what we can make of it. And so we, we started uh, putting together a group of people that we thought might, this might be fun to have more than just us investing in shows. And launched the Broadway Investors Club, had over 1,300 people reach out in the past few months alone. So uh, this it sounds like, Jason, it started from the idea of you like doing this. Maybe some of your friends would like doing it. You must have been talking about it and somebody said, I'm interested or like, you know, you and I are, are aware of the SEC laws of like soliciting things. Like how, how did it organically ha- happen? Yeah, I, I've been writing about it for a while. I had um, I met with a, a lead producer a few months, well, I'm going to take it back, a couple of years ago who said, you know, you have a background in the entertainment industry. You've invested in a lot of shows and a lot of people don't understand the law. They don't understand the whole business side of entertainment. And what if you just kind of set up a website and start writing about it? So so I did. And next thing I knew, I started getting inquiries from people. How do I invest in shows? Or I've invested in shows with other producers and I don't know how it works because I don't have any contact with them. I'm not getting any updates or feedback. So I started writing more and more about it. And then when we had this chance to, when I decided to launch the club, I thought, well, what if we take what we've built already and gear it towards this actual idea of creating a community of people? That why does it have to be this exclusive club of the same group of people that invest in every show or produce every show And why can't we give access to people all around the country who may have the means to invest, but they don't either have the know-how or they don't have the connections to get in? Most of the early shows that I invested in was because I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who happened to have an allocation in a show. And I should be so grateful for the opportunity to be able to put my money into a Broadway show. And what I've learned now over the years is when we look at the actual business structure of these shows, I can't tell what shows will make money because there's a lot of factors beyond our control. But you can almost guarantee the ones that won't because their budgets just don't make sense. The recruitment schedules seem overinflated. It's just not re- it's not practical. Uh, and so I'm looking at it from different angles where I'm looking for good investments for me. But I also see this power in numbers because if 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 a lead producer is looking to invest or to raise money for a show, wouldn't it be logically easier to reach out to a group that has a hundred people versus reaching out to a hundred people separately? That's what I've been finding. It's it's almost like this instant market research because I can get an opportunity, I can share it with our group, and I can get that instant feedback from them if anybody's interested. If nobody's interested, if 40 people are interested and at what levels or the questions that we're getting from people, which are great questions to help us make better investment decisions. So it's, it's been a, it's been a, a, an interesting sort of arc of what I thought it was going to be is just maybe me and a few of my friends kind of sharing opportunities with each other to really building a network of people who can bring opportunities to us. They can share their experiences. We're getting opportunities in startup companies now, in films, in cast albums, in live captures, Broadway shows, West End shows, tours, things that are well beyond just that instant Broadway show. But now we're seeing a whole facet of the entertainment industry that's now kind of merging into it. Jason, I was about just about to say that you are blowing my mind with this idea that you're coming to the industry, the business of Broadway from such like a a selfless perspective that you want to be involved, that you want to help other people get involved, that you have a natural connection. How have people been responding? I first launched it officially, I would say maybe August of 2022. I've been investing in shows for more than 10 years, but I'd never really been open to the idea of formally working with other friends or or partners on projects. It was sort of it all, the projects would come to me for an opportunity to invest. But I was never really open to that idea. And so when I launched the Broadway Investors Club, August 2022, 
I'd say our first month, we probably had about 50 people reach out to us uh, for information, to talk to me, to, to get to know us a little bit more. And now here we are about six months later, we've had over 1,300 people reach out. We've got about 200 people, 200 accredited investors who are already part of the club. And, uh, and every week, I feel like we're adding more and more people. And, and it's not just the investors what's, what's, uh, who's been coming to us. We're also getting lead producers who are coming to us to look for investors. We're getting shows coming to us who are looking to get development funds, front money deals, uh, or, or just to give them some guidance on their projects. And we're also getting theaters coming to us who are looking for new projects to, to develop because there's a lot of theaters out there. And many of these theaters uh, around the country, actually around the world, are looking for new shows to develop because for them, there's either they need new content for their patrons or they'd love to get in on the ground on a new show to help get it to Broadway or beyond. So we've had theaters. There's a theater in, in London that we've been talking to, theater in Florida, some theaters throughout the country. In London also, we talked to a couple of producers there about getting involved in some early shows. But the response has been remarkably overwhelming uh, in a very positive way. Uh, but it also told me that there was this need that people had, that we just didn't have this access point. And so now that we do, it's really this community that we're building to help continue to develop and expand our industry. It sounds incredible. What uh, can you tell me? Being conscious of privacy laws, of course, can you tell me, like, describe the type of investor you have? Like, I've seen some writing of like, we represent the farmers, the small business owners. The like, what is the type of investor? Can you profile them for me a little bit? Give me a sense of, of who's who's interested. I mean, the main requirement is that they have to meet the SEC definition of an accredited investor. And that's a challenge because that limits people's access and opportunities. But that's, of course, well beyond our control. That's something that I think as the rules change, more and more people will have these opportunities. The demographic is really all across the board. I mean, it's everybody from Silicon Valley folks who are who, who invested in startups to people in the finance industry from wealth managers to financial advisors, people with a Series 7 license, attorneys, doctors, business owners, producers, people who are fortunate to have some family funds, uh, family businesses. There's some family groups also. Uh, it's, it's really across the board. It's really the, the minimum threshold to get involved is to meet the SEC definition of accredited investor, which is changing and has changed over the last few years. It used to be primarily, we'd look at the financial component where you'd have to have, I think it's 200,000 a year for two years minimum with the expectation that you're gonna continue or have assets of a million dollars or more. But there's now a professional component where if you have certain financial licenses, like I believe it's a series seven license and a couple of others, that you'd also qualify under the SEC's rules. For me, there's really no, there's no, I'm going to say no discrimination in the sense that I'm not looking at the person per se. It's more of whether they're going to qualify because the, a lot of the Broadway shows have these requirements and that's what restricts us from, I would say, opening the door to more people that we'd love to be able to do if we were able to. As you are approached by producers of a number of uh, in a number of industries, it sounds like both the film and in Broadway and also West End, like a number of different areas. Uh, how do you vet them? Do you vet them by these opportunities by committee? Uh, do you spearhead that vetting process? What does that look like? Yeah. So the first first point is usually first point of inquiry will come to me to see if I'm interested. And I would say I probably pass on a good 90, 95 percent of the projects that I don't feel have the commercial viability. They may be fantastic projects, but they may not have the commercial viability because of something that's in them. And I'm surprised, honestly, of how many projects are set up for failure and don't even know it. Of the ones that I think have potential, I'll usually share it with our group and then gauge interest. That gives me that instant market research. Now, it doesn't mean that a project won't be successful just because nobody's interested in it. But uh, we had a project recently that we sent around 
and over 40 people in our group were interested in the project versus another one where not one person had any interest whatsoever. So when it gets to that phase, it tells me what we need to do next. Sometimes an investor just really wants to be in a particular project. They don't care about the numbers. They don't care if the show loses all its money. They don't care about any of that. For whatever personal connection or nostalgia, they just want to be part of that project. From an investment perspective, I look at the numbers. I look at the uh, an opportunity to invest in a project. We get certain information. So it's not just here's the producer, here's who's in it, do you guys want to invest, here's what the minimum is. We'll usually get an operating agreement for the show, we'll get recruitment, uh, project, re recruitment projections, and uh, some history of the show, we may get some samples of songs from the show, uh, if they've done any workshops, we may get some videos to look at, uh, prior news articles, in, and that's often presented in what they call a pitch deck. Every pitch deck's a little bit different, the information that we get is a little bit different, but that's generally what we'll get as a big picture. And then when I look at these recruitment schedules, I look at the capitalization also, and I see how much are they raising? Uh, what do I think the likelihood of them ever getting a dollar back is? What are the, uh, is this a show that can go on tour? Is this a show that can be licensed in high schools across the world? Get what they call stock and amateur rights. So I'm looking at all those uh, in the initial vetting and then Kind of gauging the feedback from the group and that'll tell us if if we want to set up a, sometimes we'll set up a company together we can kind of bundle uh we'll invest as you know maybe there's five people that want to put together their own small company to invest as a group into that project but everybody makes their own decisions there's no requirement to invest in any particular project there's no fund that we're investing people's money for them um not setting up, we're not setting anything up like that now. It's more really just a group of people who love theater, love the arts. We're all looking for opportunities and making our own decisions to see what we think is a good fit for us. So Jason, it's how, I'm hearing you say that there's a helpful benefit to this group is your ability to look at the commercial viability. You can look through the operating agreement, you can look at the projections, you can look at the recruitment reports and say, I think this has a pretty good idea or it's a non-starter. Right. I also heard you said something yeah. that was interesting, like um, that there'll be some things in the show that people did. I hear you say that there'll sometimes be things in the show that you think people aren't interested in. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? Like there's a show we looked at recently. It's coming to Broadway next year. I'm, I'm excited to see it. But I think from a business perspective, it's a very challenging investment because when I first looked at the shows pitched to me just as an investor a couple of years ago, the total capitalization was about, I'm going to say 25% less than it is now. And the running costs are much higher than what we expected. And so when I look at a show like that, it has to run for maybe a year and a half at 75% capacity just to get your money back. And then, then you'll hit profit after. But when I look at a lot of the shows, the current trend on Broadway, most theaters are not going to let you stay open for a year and a half if you're not making profit. Because these theaters, a lot of them have an interest in the show. Uh, they'll get a percentage of the box office. And if the show's just not making a lot of money, there's often a stop clause in these contracts that exactly. the theaters can kick them out. Right. So when I look yep. at that, it, as much as I'd love to be involved in that show, I just don't see a way that we can ever get any money. And if we put it in, we're probably going to lose it all. So the show may be great to go watch, but it's just not set up for success. And and I don't know why. I don't know if it's because of the company management or the producer on it, but the show has to make good financial sense. You know, we're we're involved in Hades Town. I invested in Hades Town uh, early on, and it was a fantastic investment. The budget was sensible, the running costs were sensible, the team was fantastic, the the producers on it had a really good heart going into it. And the show was set up for success and it's been doing really, really well. You know, we're a few years in already uh, and the show's still doing well. It's so interesting for you to call out those factors. It sounds like you see trends going both ways. There's so many questions for you, Jason. I, one of my questions is like the commerciality versus the artwork. But I'm hearing you talk to your investors. There was a fiduciary responsibility of saying, look, you've got to be, it can be as great as art as it can be, but if it doesn't run, then 
what's the use in supporting something like that? And I think that's part of what I've heard over the last 10 plus years of investing in shows is that co-producers or lead producers would come to me as an investor and they're leading with the art. They're leading with how great of a story it is. But I have to balance that. You know, I love the artistry of this industry. My family, we've had for, gosh, I mean, decade plus of uh, annual pa uh, subscription to the Art Center in Miami and Broward Center uh, in Fort Lauderdale. And we've always loved the arts and my son being an artist himself. And I, I try to balance the two. We wanna have great art that people can enjoy and, and messages that people need to hear through the art. But I also know that on the flip side, if we don't have the funds, that art can't really happen as easily. And so, and, and if people are looking at this as an investment, we can create a lot more art if we have more money. So I'm trying to balance the two. And that kind of led us to, in a sense, the next step of where we thought the industry was going was one of our frustration points was a lot of these shows that we get pitched are in the, are, I'm going to call them in the box shows, where the show is pitched to us and it's just a one and done. So you invest in the Broadway show. If it makes money, you make money. If it loses money, you lose your money. But that's it. And there's a trend now that I'm seeing is these hybrid models where producers are now trying different things, different ways to make it more enticing to investors and also to the show itself where they're including in the capitalization, it may be the Broadway show, but they're also including the national tour so that when you invest your money, you're getting both for that same price. Uh, and now we're looking at shows where we're including, so I just produced my first live capture of an off-Broadway show a few weeks ago. Uh, we're set to release it sometime soon. And we have another one that we just signed on to do a live capture of another show sometime this spring, which I'm, incredibly excited about. And I just saw the first draft of the edits for the first live capture we did. But part of our idea with that is that we're going to bring in the revenue from the live capture into that same capitalization. So as an investor, I'm not just investing in the Broadway show or off-Broadway show and having the potential revenue streams from that, from the ticket sales, but we're also now going to get a piece of the live capture, which can live for the next 50 years. You know, we can license that out. We can Sell, uh, sell it or license it to a streaming network. There's a, a, a new company, Stellar Live, which I'm involved yep. with now. Yep. And oh, Stellar, uh, yeah, so I'm an advisor with Stellar. And we can build uh, not just a streaming network like a Broadway on demand, Broadway HD type of model, but we can actually do live capture like every Friday night at 8 p.m. You can buy a ticket and watch Stranger Sings, the musical, captured live off Broadway and really build a community. So every Friday, you and all these other fans are going to log in and or you have the option to log in every other Friday and, or every Friday and watch a show with other people. And and we capture it in a way that you feel like you're sitting in the audience. It's a we did a seven cap, a seven camera live capture and we got the board audio. It's a beautiful sound and you really feel that you're in this intimate room with everybody else watching the show. Just from an investor perspective, what we're looking for is what does that opportunity look like as a whole? So is it just I'm investing in the Broadway show and that's it? Or are these producers really looking at this and saying, look, Jason, I know you guys are putting your hard your hard earned money into this show. I'm going to do everything I can to try to get it back. We want to put on sure. a great show. You're going to employ a lot of people. We're going to get this artwork out there. Uh, and we're going to do our, our, our darndest to try to get everybody their money back and try to get profit on that so that we have more to put into more shows as we continue to grow. Uh, Jason, one of the things I love about this business is I feel like it's the opportunity to engage both the business side of my mind and also the art side. And I hear that in you, too, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Can I talk specifics about the live capture of Stranger Things? Stranger yeah, Things? Stranger Things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I loved so it. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. So it was, it is, was, is at St. Luke's, it's in the round. How was capturing that live capture in the round? Can we talk about that? Yeah, so I'm going to say that this is probably one of the hardest live captures we will ever do, which <laughs> was one of the greatest experiences, though, because we learned so much putting it together. 
and and making sure and because we had so many wires around we had to make sure that the actors were safe that they were comfortable uh that we had that we captured because we're in the round the actors are constantly turning around so we had to to really be mindful of that where we were setting up the cameras and then the editing process uh John Andrews who did the editing is one of the most brilliant editors uh, I've ever worked with and uh and Dave Markin who we worked with on the capture also Dave and I are, are producing a lot of stuff together and just fantastic humans that are, are just have such a great vision and can hear my my thoughts of like what I'm envisioning and have them help to put this together but we had six cameras around and then we did an overhead uh of an HD camera but these are all 4K cameras we've got beautiful video content and uh and a real immersive feeling so yeah it was it was a, a challenge but i think you know doing any stage ones moving forward are going to be so much easier uh than than trying to capture an in the round type of of, of show as a industry as a community live capture just exploded with disney plus releasing hamilton's live capture i mean it just yeah. changed what we do and how we approach shows going into in the pandemic i think about the capture of diana like it just changed as a producer what i hope to do with each show you talked about rolling in the live capture as part of the capitalization is the live capture the new cast album idea can we will you talk about um how you approached it in terms of unions and what is the archival copy what it you went into it saying this will be the live capture we will compensate the designers, the creatives, the actors accordingly. Can you talk about that part of it? Yeah, so it's it's an interesting development. The Hamilton is sort of like the top sort of best case scenario at this stage of the game, right? They went in there, uh, they filmed it from my understand a couple of a couple of shows. They did some pickups. Beautiful show. And but most shows aren't they're not Hamilton, right? Like your your average your typical Broadway show it doesn't have the extra couple million dollars or million dollars to put together a live capture. They're already on a tight budget as it is. So what my goal was, was to figure out, is there a cost effective way? Like, let's, let's say hypothetically, I can go to a show and say for $50,000 for an off Broadway show, say for 50 to a hundred thousand dollars, I could do a live capture of your show. And then we can try to monetize this for the next 50 years using Stellar Live, or we can try to license it to a streaming network or something. The union part of it is a different conversation because what we, what my goal was with Stranger Sings, it's a non-union show. So our thought was, let's learn as much as we could about how to produce a capture where we don't have to worry about all of the union rules per se, give us a little bit of that flexibility, but we also wanted to make sure that it was fair to the actors, that that there's a, a model that we can work out that makes sense for everybody. And if we could monetize it and figure out how much revenue we could actually generate, again, this isn't a Hamilton type of show. Most shows are not going to be. So if we talk about the average show that would make sense for the unions, if we can figure out how much revenue potential there is, use it almost as like a pilot program and then go back to them and say, look, we have this data. Here's what we did. Here's what made sense and figure out something that makes sense for everybody. Then I think we could replicate this across the industry. So the next show that we're doing is a union show, but there's not a lot of actors and musicians that are in it. So that's going to be our, I'm going to say our next step where we're going to work through, uh, if there's any musician union that we need to work through or through equity, what factors do we need to consider? What do they need to consider to move the needle for them so that we can then take this to the next show that maybe has more actors or more musicians or choreography? And so I think putting these pieces together is, uh, you know, I'm looking at this as a nice, slow, steady growth where we can learn and grow together and figure out what makes sense. The old model really, in my opinion, for the most part is broken. You know, very few shows make money or they can make a lot of money on tour, but the Broadway model itself is a challenge. But if we can add another revenue stream to it, then that opens that door for, uh, I think, much more potential for everybody. Jason, I just saw in some of the headlines a new league, Broadway League of Livestream. 
Mm-hmm. Do you know, can you talk to me about that or you're, are you involved with that at all? I'm not. I'm not as familiar with it, so I don't want to misspeak on it. Okay. But I, but that tells me that the direction that we're heading is that there's a lot of other people who have these similar mindsets that the current model doesn't seem to be working as effectively as it did, say, 50 years ago. Uh, the way we consume information is different than the way that we cons- or consume entertainment is different than the way we consume entertainment now. And that includes music, it includes video. You know, we're watching things on our phone. There's, we're used to engaging with people during videos. You, know, you can have live chats going during a, a, a YouTube stream or a video stream. Like there's different groups that you can do shared watches together. So I think if we combine that um, with Broadway, it gives us a lot more potential. And what, what the capture world also does, and something that we're exploring now, is we go back to that sports model. And when the idea of having sports on TV was presented, it was chaos, right? There was people, you know, it's going to take away from that live experience of watching a football game or a baseball game. But the flip side is it's now turned into this mega billion dollar industry that is now giving extra revenue to the to the athletes, uh, to everybody involved. There's a whole business model that came from that. And so imagine in a live capture, if we can have pre-roll, we can have pre-roll ads that run. We can have, if it, it, intermission is 15 minutes, we can control that intermission time. We can add, we can put ads during that intermission. We can talk about other projects. We can have the writer give a five minute interview about how they came up with the piece. You can give more of that intimate experience to the user watching. So there's a ton of things that we can do to, uh, to both protect the art and to add revenue to the industry, which can help the actors, it can help the musicians, it can help the producers and investors. And I think we can all benefit and increase the reach of our industry to communities that just may not have access. You know, Jason, you're talking about two important things. One is accessibility. How are we making Broadway more accessible? And I've long had that concern about the cost of tickets, right? And also the accessibility Mm -hmm. of who can get on, who can be in New York at the time. So this idea of like streaming the Met or streaming like a ballet perform, like that's, that's happened in the past, but you're really like, you're really onto something that's a new model, you use the sports example business model about um, how you can pre-roll ads or have this intimate interview. One of my favorite movies as of late has been the uh, Top Gun rewired, <laughs> the next <laughs> version of Top Gun. And it starts off with Tom Cruise just saying, hey, thanks for watching. It reminded me a little bit of like Hugh Jackman as he was uh, producing um, The Greatest Showman, just like, thanks for being a part of like, this is mm-hmm. how uh, it's supposed to be experiences in the theater. Uh, and you're what I'm hearing you say is that um, you are trying to protect the art, not replace the art, that we're not moving to a model where we create a $20 million Broadway show only to stream it. But in addition to like in tandem, is that what I'm hearing? Like, like, uh, I mean, we started at the top of this call, like a hybrid model. Is that, is that how you see it in five, 10 years? I do. I actually, I, I would envision a world where, a show runs on Broadway and different options even where let's say the first Saturday of every month could be a live streamed version of the show. Like we can just stream it live the first Saturday of every month or we tape the show. We do a live capture early in the run and maybe two, three months in, we can then announce that every Saturday you're able to watch the live capture. And what I don't love with the live capture, I'm not going to say I don't love it necessarily, there's a different place for certain shows. There are some shows right, right now where you can, the on-demand world, where you kind of rent it. It's like a blockbuster model, right? You're going to rent it for 24 hours or 48 hours. But I feel like to me, that becomes more of a rental model where if I'm looking at a live experience, then a live capture presented at a specific time and date, like you're going to go to the movies to watch it at a certain point, or you're going to go to the theater to watch it at a certain point, I think has a different experience that we're going to get because there we're really watching it as a group. Like when you go to the movie theater, you're feeling the energy of the movie with a hundred other people in the room with you. You know, we don't necessarily Mm -hmm. think of it that way, but we could watch a movie when it comes out on HBO uh, or, or Netflix 
But people still go to the movie theaters because they want to enjoy it in this community experience. Um, I think that we're going to find that people would want to watch it, uh, would want to watch it captured together. You know, and we're, we're getting a huge demand already with Stranger Things, people online like, I live in this state, I can't get to New York. Is there any way I can watch it? Well, it tells me that there's a demand for it. And so I'm hoping that when we, when we eventually launch it, that we're going to have that response from people. You know, flip side is another show that we're going to be capturing. I don't think our intention is to do a stellar live with that one. I think that one is going to be much more of a license it to a streaming network because I just think it sits better in that world. And so, you know, I'm going to say that there's not a one and only model for this. I feel like you know, we've got to look at each show, look at the audience. Where do we think it's going to be placed? And then the other part, which was a, an interesting angle that the lead producer, uh, one of the leads from Stranger Things said to me was, I love what you're doing with the live capture. And I think that is a great model that we can work with. But the other value that I see in the live capture is that we're looking to license this show all around the world. And traditionally, when you're going to license for stock and amateur or to license it to another producer to, to do it in the West End or London or Asian tour, you'd send them the script, you'd send them the music. But now imagine if I could send them an actual <laughs> video of the show. Sure. Right? Not you just archival, see... right? The whole That's thing. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I could show you a professionally recorded video of our entire show which I think is going to blow up the marketing of this. It's going to blow up the, the stock and amateur licensing potential. And I think if shows consider it, even if it's just for that component, that can enhance the value of these productions significantly. Jason, true or false, every Broadway off-Broadway show should be considering doing a live capture. True. Everyone should absolutely consider it. I was heartbroken when K-pop announced that they were closing. I know. I, like, I saw that show... Uh, a couple of weeks before, and I was sitting in that theater thinking I could totally capture this show. This would probably be easier than what we did with Stranger Things. And gosh, what an experience this would be. Then they announced that they were closing. And then I heard online that they were doing a, a live stream of the show until I saw that it was like somebody holding up an iPhone doing an Instagram live. And, oh, and I was heartbroken because, you know, it was just such a great experience of a show that I feel like that would be a great show that could be licensed to uh, to a streaming network, to, to a cable network, and it just didn't have the opportunity. So what I would, my advice to producers, to general managers in particular, is let's consider it. Let's have the conversation early on. While you're thinking of your capitalization, we can think about the live capture cost and, and potential and what we can even do with the live capture, because what we figured out with Stranger Things is we can capture the board audio, which means I can get a cast album from that audio. <laughs> right? I've been we don't thinking need... about this, Jason. You're reading right. my mind. Right. Like, I don't have to spend 100000 200000 in a studio. I've got the audio. I could do some pickups after if we need to, if the, if the audio is not perfect. But, but gosh, I, I have the audio captured from the board. And what what is the what is my listener carry? They, do they need to have a studio recording, or can I say live from Broadway? You know, it, it's they want to hear the music. So I think that for us to have these different assets that we can get from this one opportunity uh, can really change the dynamic of the business model. Jason, uh, we are so aligned. I cannot believe how I was going to say fortuitous, serendipitous, mm -hmm. like how. I just how excited I am to hear you talking about these things and not just talking about them conceptually, but talking about what you're already doing and inroads that you're already making. I feel like at this point in this conversation, Jason, I want to call out that by no means are we trying to shortcut or undercut any of the creatives in this process, that the directors, that the choreographers, that the designers, that the actors, like that everyone who's making this will all be compensated. Can you talk about how that looks? Yeah, my, my idea with this was that if we add this revenue stream, if we can give a percentage of any profits from the stream and trickle it down to everybody who is involved, I think that's the ideal here because we're not trying to create a new a, a, an asset from it that's going to cut people out. I think if we can figure out a way that gives everybody more money, 
and shares in the in the success of the capture, then we all benefit from it. And if we have the people involved in the capture who can, can to make sure that the 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 property is protected, that's going to be key. So with Stranger Things, we had the show's director and the show's writer at the capture. We talked about the lighting. They got to look at the camera angles before we went live. They got to talk to the the uh, producing team of the capture. They talked to the camera operators. They got to be intimately involved in it and to give their direction, to give their feedback during it. So we want this to be a collective environment. We, we all want to make sure that the show is protected and that it meets the expectations of the writers. And so the, the first draft that we got back, the response that we got from the team was, wow, wow, wow. Like <laughs> this is beyond anything I could have even remotely imagined this was going to look like. And to me, it was such a great feeling because I feel like our vision is now coming forward where we really can show people what the show looks like. And I don't think it's going to, and in fact, this was the feedback from the team also, we don't think this is going to detract from the, from wanting to see the show. I think it's going to make people want to see the show even more because they're going oh, to yeah. feel like, right? Like they're, they're hearing the music, they're seeing the actors, like, like they're going to really feel like this is something that they want to see or, or need to see or other show or other uh, venues who see it. Like, I feel like this is something that they're going to want to bring to their, their venues to get their audiences to see it also in person. So a hundred percent. In fact, I know uh, studies have suggest that, that once they see the live capture, whatever it is, it doesn't preclude them from wanting to go and see the show. I think that's awesome. So look ahead even further than you're already looking ahead, Jason, to like, what are the pitfalls? Like, where is the, I want to say like the, the, where are we going to get constricted? Is it in the crews? Is it in like, what's, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's like the constriction point, you know, like where's the, uh, the, the, the center of the eye, uh, hourglass where we think, uh, like, what does that look like? What, what I feel that? like we're, yeah, like, I feel like it's the proof of concept that we can go to the unions and say, look, this isn't going to be a, a a uh, Hamilton model. You know, this not every show's like that. Not every show is Diana where they're putting people up in a hotel for a month or whatever they did. You know, this isn't where they there was no audience there. We want this to be a real feeling like you're there watching a show. And I, I feel like we've got to be able to go to the unions and say, look, we could do this in a safe way. We're going to protect the 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 actors and all those involved. We want to make sure that this doesn't impede with their normal performance. But we also, maybe there's a way we can trickle down, we can share profits with them. Uh, in addition to 100%. that side of it, we've also figured out that we can get IMDB credits. We can get film credits for everybody who worked on the show. So with Stranger Things, we've said that there's an IMDB profile now of the show. All of the actors are on there. They all got credits on that side of it. The producers, the creatives, the choreography, costumes, lighting, sound, everybody involved in it has credits now. And I think that that's a big part of it. We can go to these these unions uh, and say, look, here's what we can do. And even for the shows that are not union, we could do this for them also. And I feel like it's going to give them even more growth potential because they're going to have this tangible asset. So yeah, I'm excited about that part of it. You know, there, there's a whole world. There's, I mean, we could talk forever on this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, even even on the producing side, you know, I, we had talked about, you know, there's a there's a question of I know there was some conversation about whether a percentage of profit should should trickle to the actors or to the creatives that are involved in the show. And and I was thinking through, like, is there a different way we can do this? Like, what if the what if they form their own producing group? Like, what if the actors say, you know, 10 actors each say we're going to try to raise twenty five thousand dollars each. And you put together a bundle of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is usually a, a producing unit, and and they don't have to put it in themselves. They can just you know reach out and try to find people, um, work together as a team, and maybe they can raise the money. And now they're sharing profits as producers, and they're getting producing credit. And if the show wins a Tony Award, they're now Tony Award winning producers. And there's a whole world of opportunity that I think we can talk to the actors to to maybe even educate them on some of these possibilities that they can do themselves to really feel more invested in the, in the shows than they already do, uh, already are. 
Jason, Broadway is a slow moving vehicle to adjust, right? Like it, it's, we make changes incrementally in a big ship, <laughs> but you're talking pivoting with known entities, Broadway shows, even off Broadway shows, you're talking about using um, technology that's available. Do you see this happening? I mean, it's already happening. It's already happening fast. Uh, what, what I would say is when I first started practicing law, I used to build websites for fun back in college. And when I first started practicing, I worked for a firm who did mostly TV and phone book marketing, which is how attorneys had marketed in the personal injury world for, for decades. And I used to build websites. So when I first started to launch my first website more, about 20 years ago, I was told at that time that nobody will ever go online to find a lawyer. He said, you're wasting your time. Lawyers are, you know, we, we don't do this type of stuff. And, and I said, no, I'm telling you, like, this is the direction that, that we're going. My generation, we know websites. We know the internet. It, it was still in its infancy at the time, relatively. And most people were building websites for like a business card. And, and I was building it out. I used to study Google's patents. I would read them, try to figure out what their algorithms were. And I was kind of like nerding out over the internet at that time and, and trying to figure it out. And fast forward, you know, 20 plus years, and the first place somebody's gonna go to find a lawyer is Google. They're gonna go, or, or Bing or whatever, they're gonna go online. And I feel like the direction, when I look at my son and I look at my daughter and I look at how their friends consume entertainment, it's dynamically different than you and I had consumed entertainment when we were 15, 16 years old. And we have to look at the younger generation, I think, to figure out where are we going? And they're gonna be the folks who don't adapt, but we have to adapt and just keep moving forward, I feel like, and we're gonna build our community around that. And then at some point, the, the non-believers become believers because it's happening. I mean, we know it's happening. We did a live stream from New World Stages during the pandemic, a, a musical that my son wrote. And we had I mean, hundreds of people logged in from around the world to watch it, well beyond our expectations. So we're testing these things to see what's working, what's working better, how do we optimize it? But I feel like it's happening. And if we can figure out a, a, uh, an economical way of moving forward, then we can really make this make the live capture world, the cast albums, uh, Broadway itself, off-Broadway models, West End, just build this industry where these, these intertwining disciplines now from film and music and, and stage are really much more intertwined now than ever before. And if we can figure out how to really build a good model around that, I think there's just mad success for everybody ahead of us. Incredible, Jason. It's not, will the actors creative teams get credit it's yes and more so yeah that's it as, you know, yeah that, that, yeah tenfold that, right that's it Ten you know what that was a question with stranger things was like well how do we do the credits well great I, I, we we know how to do it with film credits we've done a bunch of them already and and we can get everybody film credit on it and on the actual recording itself we can have screens that, you know, written by so-and-so, directed by so-and-so. We can have ending credits and everybody involved in the show can get credit for it. You know, we're not trying to, to exclude people who worked on the shows that this in fact can give them exposure because now their name is gonna be on every stream that people watch. It's not just in a playbill that people may or may not read, but it's gonna be on camera. It's gonna be online uh, on, on IMDB or, or the film, you know, in these film credit sites. So, yeah, I think if we, you know, just having these conversations that, which I'm so grateful for even for, for talking to you about this, because I feel like if the more we can have these conversations and get an understanding of what we really want to do with this, we're not trying to replace theater. We're not trying to exclude people. This, this I feel like, will give access and opportunity to people around the world, to our industry, and to really expand the reach of the shows uh, and just give potential forever. Jason, if people wanted to be a part of it, they could find you. Tell us how they would find you. And then I have one final question. Like, there'll be other people doing it, but you clearly have a strong handle on what's happening and, and are really a pioneer in making this work. Uh, how would people find you? Yeah, so uh, website is investingbroadway.com. Uh, it's the Broadway or Google the Broadway Investors Club. And again, there's no fees to join us. Uh, we're looking for 
a solid group to continue growing. And I feel like, you know, like I said earlier, the, the more people who are part of our club, the more things we can do together. You know, we're putting together these minds, these forward thinking minds to with ideas well beyond what I could think of or or you. We just we all pool our resources and, and we can really help shape the industry to what we want it to, to look like to give that access to uh, and opportunities to people who may not have otherwise had it. It's not a fund. It's more than a fund. It's not even a fund. It's a think tank. You develop a think tank. That's it. I, I like to think of us as a a fun group of people who love theater, who love to invest in the business of theater, and who are very forward thinking and looking to, we look at a bulging industry that has operated in a very similar way for for decades now, and it's ripe for some change and ripe for more opportunities for all of us. And and I think the the more traditional producers I would love for them to be open to these ideas because we're not looking to change or replace what they've done. We're really looking to enhance what, they, what they're doing and to build upon it and to build a great foundation for the future. My last question is different than what we've talked about for the last few minutes. Um, I know that you are passionate about giving back. I want to talk about, is it Betty Cares? It is. Can you can you tell me a little bit about like why that's important to you and how that relates to our conversation? Yeah, I um my wife's mother passed away and we had a family member who was sick in the hospital and, and I just you know we giving back is always very important to my family. Uh everything every year we try to to give back in in various ways. And I think it's it's important that if we're grateful or privileged to be in our position to help people who may not be. And we found ourselves in, in a hospital where we just didn't have all the resources around us. A lot of people, when they go to the hospital, it's an emergency. And when we're, you know, if you're taking care of a loved one, you just don't have all the resources around you. So we set up Betty Cares at Miami Children's Hospital. Now, uh, now it is the Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. We partnered with them several years ago to uh, to create a fund there where if families are there with children in the hospital and need a pair of socks or need a, a phone charger or some food uh, or if they need a laptop so they can keep working to still sit by their child's side, but they still need to be able to earn a living. And so we donated a number of laptops, iPads, charging station, anything that people need there that we are able to help with. Uh, we had a fund that we'd set up to help people. And every year we would do a, f a fundraiser before we came to New York uh, about eight years ago. We would do these events where a friend of ours had a car museum that he donated to let us put on this these these amazing events. And we'd fly down Broadway performers and entertain people in South Florida and give them access to Broadway and try to raise money for for charity. And so it's it's always been something very dear to us. Broadway's always been in our hearts for for many many years, and and so is giving back. So I think that that is a huge part and driver for what we do is to just you know, try to try to look for the good in what we're doing. Um, that that's our hope. You know, we're sure there's the business side of this industry, uh, but we want to lead with really trying to create good art, balancing the two sides and giving back to the community when we can. Beautiful. Well, Jason, uh, it has been my pleasure to talk with you and to get a sense of your thinking, your brain, your perspective on this fabulous world we call Broadway, both the business of show business and also the art of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course.